Hi guys, uh, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to talk to you about SVTs uh, or supraventricular tachycardia and the best way to try and get out of a supraventricular tachycardia episode when you're in one. All right. Now, SVT or supraventricular tachycardia is not an uncommon condition. It's a heart rhythm disturbance. It tends to affect um, all uh, age groups, but is commonly seen in younger people as well. And basically what happens is that uh, some people have an extra pathway in their heart um, and what happens is the normal electrical impulses just go down the normal kind of wiring but once in a while you can get the impulses going down the normal wiring but then coming up this extra pathway uh, leading to a short uh, circuiting of the electrics of the heart and this can cause a very fast heart rate so usually the way it will manifest is the patient is fine uh, doing their own thing and then for some reason suddenly like a light switch their heart starts beating very fast and that it often beats at around about 160 180 beats per minute it's regular but it's very fast and one of the problems then people have is that they're sitting there and they feel uncomfortable because the heart is going so fast um, and they're always wondering well how do i come out of it now a lot of people who've had this from a young age have managed to work out often managed to work out ways of coming out of it so some people say look i just lie down and relax some people say i rub my eyes uh, some people say i just deep take deep breaths in and out um, and um, sometimes these methods work however uh, one method which has uh, been shown to work is the Valsalva maneuver and basically what the Valsalva maneuver is is that you're basically trying to blow out you're trying to blow out against a closed airway so in essence what you're trying to do is you're trying to strain and you're trying to blow but there's nowhere for this air to go so you're actually it's almost like straining so for example imagine if you're on the toilet and you need to strain uh, so you would uh, you would sort of low but you wouldn't really let anything come out so you're increasing the pressure inside the chest and that um, often works uh, well not often but that can work in terminating an SVT episode the easiest way to do this is to acquire a syringe um, from uh, a local sort of uh, chemist or um, or your local hospital if you suffer from SVTs and the nozzle of the uh, syringe you know is uh, what you do is you put that in your mouth form a tight seal around that and then blow as hard as possible to try and start getting the plunger out you know trying to move the plunger out the other end uh, and that is a Valsalva maneuver and it is no it is um, felt that this is effective in about 17% of the time, right? 17% of the time doing a really good Valsalva maneuver can help stop the SVT. However, today what I wanted to do was share with you uh, a really interesting study called the Revert Study, where they found a better method to try and get out of SVTs. Uh, the problem with this kind of thing is if a Valsalva maneuver doesn't work, then the poor patient has left. You know, it's terrifying to have such a fast heart rate. They then often have to go to hospital, and in hospital they're given this thing called adenosine, which is a really horrible. Um, it's 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 a, it's an agent which can be very effective, but it does cause the heart to slow down very excessively, causes chest tightness, and gives patients this feeling of impending doom, which they don't like. This lasts only a few milliseconds, but still, it's a very uncomfortable sensation, and a lot of people dread the thought of having to go to hospital to get adenosine to come out of their SVT. So, if we can work out ways in by, by which we can improve the likelihood of getting out of the SVT using the Valsalva maneuver, then that's clearly something that a lot of people would appreciate. So today I wanted to share a study which was called the Revert Study where they added an extra modification to this Valsalva maneuver uh, and that seemed to improve the success rate of coming out of SVT from 17% to almost 43%. Uh, and so basically what these guys did is what they found was that actually what you should do if you're in an SVT episode is to uh, sit, uh, sit down so that your legs are flat and your... Um, body is at a 45 degree angle so you're basically sitting with your head up um, and then what they recommend is that you blow into this um, syringe for example uh, at the nozzle end blow as hard as possible to try and get the plunger out and then once you've done that what they recommend is that you lie back so you lie flat back uh, flat on the bed that you're on 
and lift your legs right up. And what this does is it increases the amount of blood going back to the heart. And if you do this, then they find that the success rates of coming out of the SVT improve some, from 17% to 43%. Uh, if it doesn't work once, you can do it again, uh, but that seems to substantially improve the success rates. So I hope you found this useful. Um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll put a, a link to the study, uh, which was published in the Lancet. Uh, and actually, if you look up the study, they actually have a video of how to do it. So that would be quite useful for a lot of people. So do watch the video and the appendices of the study. There is a video on how it's done. Uh, but it would be something well worth trying when you're at home and if you're unfortunate enough to have an SVT episode. Great. Now, um, as you know, we're doing a seminar in New York on the 4th and 5th of August. Um, a lot of people have written to me, said, look, you know, we're in the States. It would be so nice if you were in the States. Uh, we could come and see you. Well, the great news about this is that on the 4th and 5th of August, I will be in New York. I will uh, be offering free consultation. So there is no charge. You can come ask me anything you like and I will try and answer your questions. Uh, no charge for this at all. Um, but uh, the only real cost is the, the, if you come for the seminar for the two days, then there is a meal and you we just uh, there is a charge for the meal, but nothing else. Uh, there's a series of really interesting talks. I'll be there. I'll be talking about POTS and I'll be talking about ectopic heartbeats and I'll be talking about atrial fibrillation. Um, so it would be a wonderful opportunity if, if you happen to be there for us to meet and ask, you can ask me anything you want. Uh, if you're interested, please consider visiting www.hearthelpweekend.com. Also, if you found these videos useful, please, please, please consider sharing them, subscribing to my channel uh, and uh, leaving a, a comment. I would be very grateful. Thank you so much and all the best. Bye. Hi, guys. My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today, I wanted to talk to you about heart rhythm disturbances. And in particular, I wanted to try and explain what is it that makes a heart rhythm disturbance dangerous? Uh, because by far and away the thing that scares everyone is that heart rhythm disturbances can be dangerous and the problem is compounded by the fact that there are so many different types of heart rhythm disturbances they all have horrible names and very difficult names and there's a lot of jargon and no one really knows you know is this dangerous is um, you know you have PVCs PACs atrial tachycardia atrial flutter atrial fibrillation uh, SVT ventricular tachycardia non-sustained ventricular tachycardia and wherever you look you think oh this could be dangerous this could be dangerous this could be dangerous so I thought I would try and explain it in a way that is easy to understand uh, and try and break it down into basics to help you understand what the relevance of any heart rhythm disturbance is and what is it that makes that heart rhythm disturbance dangerous. Okay, so the first thing to understand is that the only relevance of any heart rhythm disturbance, any heart rhythm disturbance, the thing that a heart rhythm disturbance indicates is that for the duration of that rhythm disturbance, the heart is not working as efficiently as it should. It's as simple as that. That's all it means. So the heart is a pump and the role of this pump is to pump oxygen rich blood around to our vital organs. And of course, if the heart becomes inefficient, then it will pump less blood around to our vital organs. And of course, if there is a prolonged, if that is very inefficient and there is a prolonged duration of inefficiency, then you could cause damage. You could cause damage to our vital organs. You could cause damage to our heart as well, because our heart is one of those vital organs. So the first thing to understand is that that's all the relevance of any heart rhythm disturbances. The second thing then to say is, well, what is it you know, that makes the heart, what is what is it about the heart rhythm disturbance which tells you how inefficient that heart rhythm disturbance is? And the truth is this, that the first thing to understand is that for a heart rhythm disturbance to be dangerous, to cause you damage, it has to be sustained. It has to go on for a certain duration of time, because if it is very transient, 
it is not going to be enough to cause damage, okay? Remember, what do we do with our lungs? Our lungs are responsible for getting oxygen in and they oxygenate our blood and the blood goes around. So if our lungs aren't working, for example, then you would have the same problem. You would get less oxygen in and you could cause damage. Uh, but we all know that you have to go a certain duration of time without oxygen to cause damage. Transient, um, uh, transient um, inefficiencies, such as, for example, when we swim, we hold our breath. We don't do ourselves any damage by that. Uh, it has to go on for a prolonged period of time to cause damage. So the first thing to understand is that non-sustained rhythm disturbances rhythm disturbances that don't go on for a prolonged period of time for more than 30 seconds are not going to be dangerous all right so if you have ectopics those by definition are not going to cause you any damage because they are so um, transient you know you're just being inefficient for that one beat and then it's followed by a normal beat so any non-sustained heart rhythm disturbance is by definition not going to cause you any damage and this also applies for things like nsvt non-sustained ventricular tachycardia it is non-sustained because it is non-sustained the inefficiency is non-sustained and therefore will not cause you any damage so the first thing is non-sustained rhythms do not cause us any damage sustained rhythms sustained inefficiency is more interesting all right uh, and the duration of the sustained inefficiency is very interesting. So if you have sustained inefficiency for an hour, that is not going to be as dangerous to us as, say, sustained inefficiency for three days. So that's the second thing to understand. The third thing to understand is the heart rate is important because the faster the heart rate during the rhythm disturbance, the more inefficient the heart. Why? Because the heart needs a certain amount of time to fill with blood. And if the heart is going very fast, it's not getting the time to fill with blood. And therefore, less blood is coming out just because the heart is fast. Couple that with the inefficiency of a heart rhythm disturbance makes it more interesting. So someone who has, um, uh, uh, so let's say, ventricular tachycardia at 110 beats per minute, is not going to be in danger compared to someone who has ventricular tachycardia at 200 beats per minute because a they have the inefficiency from the rhythm disturbance b the fast heart rate compounds that inefficiency uh, the third thing that has an impact on our inefficiency is where the rhythm arises from okay so atrial rhythms generally pump more blood out of the heart compared to ventricular rhythms so um, that is why atrial tachycardia is not as inefficient and is so much better tolerated than ventricular tachycardia because by very nature if it's just the ventricle that's pumping the blood out you're only getting the ventricular bit pushing the blood out the ventricle is doing the work if you have an atrial rhythm the atria is pushing blood into the ventricle and helping the ventricle push the blood out so your ventricle is filling with more blood because the atria is pumping into the ventricle and that's pushing the blood out so you're getting more blood out so that is why atrial rhythms are less inefficient compared to ventricular rhythms and finally the most important thing is do you have a heart which is already inefficient to start off with before you develop the rhythm disturbance? So if you have a damaged heart, if you have a heart that is only working at 20%, you then add in a sustained heart rhythm disturbance, which goes on for several hours, which is ventricular, which is really fast. There we're talking about a dangerous rhythm. But otherwise, if you have a non-sustained rhythm, it's not dangerous. If you have a rhythm which is um, atrial uh, as opposed to ventricular, it's not going to be as dangerous. If you have a rhythm which goes slow, it's not going at, so going at 130 beats per minute, that's not going to be as dangerous as a rhythm that is going at 200 beats per minute. And finally, if you have a structurally normal heart, then because the heart is strong, whatever inefficiency is happening because of the rhythm disturbance, at least the heart is a strong structure and therefore does pump some blood out yes it won't pump out as much because of the inefficiency from the rhythm but it's still able to pump something out if the heart is already weak and on top of that you add in the inefficiency then the heart is going to pump out a lot less and that inefficiency is dangerous 
So when people uh, contact me and say, oh, I've got ectopics, are they dangerous? Of course they're not dangerous. I have non-sustained VT. Is that dangerous? No, it's not dangerous at all because non-sustained VT is non-sustained. The inefficiency is not sustained. It is not going to do us any harm. Um, sustained rhythms, which are ventricular, which are very fast, which are on the um, background of an already damaged heart, those are the rhythms that are dangerous. So I hope this helps you understand what makes a heart rhythm dangerous and it makes you realize that actually you know you have to have a lot of things bad, a lot of bad things for a heart rhythm disturbance to be dangerous as opposed to just the odd ectopic here or a little run of uh, non-sustained vt or something like that so i hope this was helpful i would love to hear what you um, thought of this video and i hope this makes sense and if I could do things better, please let me know. Other than that, I'm really grateful um, uh, to it for everything you do. I'm sorry I haven't put a video out for a while, uh, but I will do another one. And I think my next one is going to be on Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Um, so thank you so much and all the best. Take care. My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to talk to you about SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, and in particular about a new medication that may become available very soon, which will make a huge difference to how we manage SVT, and it may offer hope for a lot of patients with SVT. The first thing to say is, what is SVT? SVT, or supraventricular tachycardia, is a heart rhythm disturbance. It tends to occur all age groups and is often seen in young, healthy people, but also seen in older people. It is characterized by sudden onset of fast, regular palpitations that can go on for several minutes or hours and then subside spontaneously. Let me tap out what an SVT feels like. So the patient is fine like this, and their heart is beating normally. And then just like a light switch, the heart goes fast. And then like a light switch, the heart comes out of this abnormal rhythm. SVT is characterized by an abnormal electrical, or an extra electrical pathway within the heart and what happens is that the impulses, the cardiac impulses, the normal electrics would go down one set of wiring, the normal set of wiring, but then they find a way back up using the abnormal uh, or the extra pathway, and therefore you get this short-circuiting mechanism which causes this very fast, regular heartbeat. SVTs are generally not dangerous, but they are incredibly bothersome. They can be very inconvenient and they can be very incapacitating. In addition, patients who have SVT can be left feeling very fearful because they don't know when they're going to have their next episode. And then because of this, they end up limiting what they do. They're scared of going out. They're scared of going on holiday because they don't know when this SVT may rear its ugly head again. SVTs are generally not considered dangerous, but they can be incredibly incapacitating and debilitating, largely because they tend to be unpredictable. And when they happen, the poor patient, A, feels very uncomfortable because it's very unnatural to feel your heart beating so fast, so quickly, and also because the patient doesn't know how long it's gonna last for, and they're sort of left waiting for this to go away. All the treatment we have available at the moment is not about the risk that an SVT may present because we don't think that SVTs tend to generally be dangerous, but rather improve a person's quality of life by reducing the number of SVTs they have. So what do we have at the moment in our armamentarium for SVT sufferers? The first is that you can use vagal maneuvers. By this I mean that if you can in some way activate your vagus nerve, slow your heart down, this can reduce the SVT and get the patient out of the SVT. Common vagal maneuvers are things like um, straining down as if you're sitting on the toilet or um, even sort of rubbing the neck, the carotid body over here, gently massaging that. That can slow the heart down, get the patient out of the SVT. And sometimes also things like taking a syringe and blowing at the nozzle to try and push the plunger out and that can sometimes terminate the SVT. These are effective only 30% of the time, so they're not very, very effective maneuvers. The next option we have is that you can use some medication. So you can use medications like beta blockers or calcium antagonists. 
and they can be used as a pill in the pocket. So the patient is fine, he goes into the SVT, he takes the tablet, and then as the tablet gets absorbed and starts working, that may have the effect of getting him out of the SVT, getting him or her out of the SVT. There are other medications as well, like flecainide. So usually these are given as a pill in the pocket rather than giving them, giving the patient these continuously every day because you know medications have side effects. So and a lot of people are young and otherwise healthy. So you don't want to subject them to side effects from medications. So they're just given as a pill in the pocket. The problem with these are that they're only really effective 50% of the time and they can take up to two hours because you have to take the tablet, the tablet has to get absorbed and then the tablet acts. So for a couple of hours the poor patient is still struggling with the symptoms and there's only a 50% chance that the medication would work anyway. The definitive treatment for SVT is ablation which is where you identify this extra pathway and you deliver, deliver a laser burn or, a, or burn this extra pathway using an ablation. And because you have then interrupted this short circuiting mechanism, that usually offers patients a cure and the SVT will not recur. The problem with uh, an ablation is that it is an invasive procedure. There is no doubt an ablation is highly effective and the risks are generally low. But remember, a lot of people still would feel uncomfortable about someone going into their heart and doing something like that, it's invasive, there is undoubtedly a small risk and that is why it is not a favoured approach for patients although it is a favoured approach for the doctor. So as a doctor if someone comes to me and says look I'm having troublesome SVT I say oh we'll have an ablation because it's low risk, highly effective but if you look at it from the patient's perspective, it's like, oh, do I really fancy a heart operation? Do I really want someone going into my heart and burning things? So those are the options, but there is still, as you can see, a real need for an effective treatment which is safe, which is convenient, and which has a rapid onset of action. So that the patient gets the SVT, he can take the medication, and the medication gets them out of the SVT very quickly. And this is where this new medication comes in. It is called etipramil. Etipramil is a potent and a new calcium antagonist. It's a short-acting calcium antagonist. It has only a half-life of 20 minutes and it is taken as a nasal spray. And the reason it's taken as a nasal spray is that it can get directly absorbed into the bloodstream without having to go down into the stomach and get digested. It is metabolized quickly and therefore doesn't remain in the body very long and therefore it doesn't cause much in the way of extra side effects. In one study, there was a group of um, electrophysiologists who studied 104 patients who were in the ablation lab and they were going to have an ablation and what these guys did is they brought on the SVT and then they gave them either placebo or this etipramil and this comes in four different doses so they gave them the etipramil in different doses and uh, they compared the effectiveness of getting the patient out of the SVT and what they found was that the conversion rates were between 65 and 95 percent with the etipramil so yes about 30 percent of patients came out of the SVT by themselves just with placebo but when you gave them etipramil at the lowest doses double the number of patients came out of the SVT and actually if you gave them the higher dose 95% of the patients came out of the SVT with the medication and the mean time to conversion was only three minutes so within three minutes you were getting patients out of the SVT. And the main side effects were a little bit of irritation to the nose because it's a nasal spray and those people who received the highest dose had a drop in their blood pressure but really not very significant and because it's a short acting agent it didn't stay in the bloodstream for very long. So this agent is um, really interesting and exciting because it offers all those things you know if people have SVT they can just carry a nasal spray with them, the SVT starts, a squirt in the nose and hopefully in about three minutes you're out of the SVT. This product is being produced by a company called Milestone Pharmaceuticals and at the moment they're doing sort of bigger studies to look at whether it would be safe for people just to get on and do this without medical supervision so that you know people can use it when they're at home etc so this is all very exciting but i suspect that in the next couple of years we should have this on the market and this may then just completely revolutionize how we treat svt
So I hope you found this useful. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and again, thank you once again for all that you do for me.